good morning uh, welcome you all back again for uh, uh, lecture number 34 uh, in lecture number 33 we just have uh, uh, looked at transient and steady state response of first order system for various standard inputs like uh, uh, unit step function uh, unit impulse function and unit ramp function and uh, at the end we have concluded that uh, importantly for an lta system that is linear time invariant system uh, we have seen a fantastic uh, relationship between this input signals and then output uh, responses of them respectively so what was that an uh, input signal uh, relationship that uh, your ram function is nothing but if we are integrating your unit step function you get it your unit step function is what you integrate uh, the unit impulse response function you get or on the other orders you can say if we have your ram function you differentiate you get your unit step function if we have your unit step input function differentiated you would get what is called an uh, unit uh, impulse uh, um, uh, function so if that holds good for linear time invariant system then respective outputs also would have the relationship that if i have a response for a unit step input uh, uh, for an lti system and the response if i <coughs> differentiate i would get uh, uh, what is called uh, the response that i would get it for an input of unit uh, impulse function if i integrate it i would get a response uh, correspondingly what is that i would get it for uh, unit ramp function so this is a fantastic relationship Uh, that holds good only for LTA system. If your system is uh, time varying system or a nonlinear system, you would see that uh, this relationship will not hold good. So uh, this LTA system, why we do always with the LTA system uh, at the beginning is because any of the mechanical system, the expectation of the operating state of the system is its steady state system, and it has to behave linearly. So uh, and the parameters should not vary as function of time. for example if we have a control system designed for automatic tooling some machining operation you see that uh, confined uh, parameters uh, are to be maintained uh, with, which are not going to be varying as function of time so uh, parameters are not varying in function of time and you get your system to be linear and that is most of the time any system uh, uh, working expectation that is why we make such an assumption and you see this type of studies of course you have to extend your understanding learning also to be extended and advanced study for looking at time varying system and uh, non linear systems and so on <laughs> right so with that uh, clear uh, idea what we are doing it is what is the system of lta is what uh, in your mind always you should have uh, for these lectures when you are understanding <laughs> so so now in this period we will get into a second order system and see that uh, only one response output that will see the response output for unit step function because for lta system when i consider if i have my unit step function response i would get what would be the corresponding functions for unit ramp or unit impulse functions so i am going to now explain this period second order system for its <coughs> unit step input as uh, uh, input what would be my output dynamic behavior right so let me just share my uh, board so hope you are able to see the system so this is lecture number no? 34 and today it is 17 4 uh, 2021 and see in the last period we have looked at first order system and that is uh, physically uh, look at an electric rc circuit or uh, thermal system heat conduction you would see that these systems are first order system and we have seen that our output and input relationship c of s by r of s is given by 1 by ts plus 1 so how is this uh, transfer function is obtained so what is the governing equation of this first order system so the first order system governing equation is t c of c dot plus 
C that's equal to R. So where R is input function, C is what is uh, uh, your uh, variable here or your response, output response, and uh, its first derivative is this. So since it is first order system, you see only uh, the order of derivative is single order, first derivative. And where T is what is called time constant. Right. So if this is that, I would get my transfer function simply by taking Laplace transform for this system. So when I take Laplace transform for this system, what is that I'm going to have? So if I apply taking Laplace transform on both sides, it is T into C dot. So C dot of T, Laplace transform is S C of S minus C of zero. That is its initial condition plus C that is going to be C of S and here it's input that's going to be R of S. So what does that we consider as initial uh, condition is zero. So this is going to be zero. So if I take C of S out, I will have here inside T of S plus one and that's going to be R of S. So and C of S by R of S is what is given by one by T S plus one, which is close to loop transfer function. Right, so this is how we have got and this transfer function. If I have, I would be able to get my unit step function uh, multiplying will give me the response. So my C of S for unit step input, it is going to be one by T S plus one into one by S. So this is solved and you've got your C of T and so on. So this is what uh, we did in the first two uh, the previous period. So now we'll uh, go and look at the second order system. So what is second order system? So second order system classical example is uh, spring mass damper system of single degree freedom. Of course, our bicycle model also is two degree freedom system is an example. Let us look at this and then uh, we will get uh, the same thing can be applied for uh, your um, bicycle model as well. So I know my uh, differential equation, governing equation for this by applying Newton's law. I can get it is mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equals uh, the forcing function that is a u of t. <clears throat> so in this, let me take k out. So if I take uh, 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 or if I divide this or if I take k out, uh, what is that it's going to be? Uh, uh, m by k x double dot plus c by k x dot plus x uh, that's going to be uh, u of t. I, I'm taking here 1 by k. Oh, sorry, k. I'm taking k out. When I take k out, I get this. So this is going to be uh, now, uh, how can you look at this system? Because you see, I, I, I know my standard uh, second order uh, transfer function G of S uh, is going to be omega n squared by uh, what is that on that day we were uh, writing down? Um, omega n squared by just let me just S squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So this is my transfer function. You would also had another day one by uh, m s squared plus uh, c s plus k. So this is also correct. So we can have this relationship. That's what I'm trying to do this uh, k you take out you have this. So what is m by k? Uh, what is m by k? Uh, you know omega n square is what is uh, uh, square of natural frequency that would be given by k by m. 
So I have here, uh, I have here, um, this is k into uh, 1 by omega i n squared x double dot plus c by k can be uh, uh, written as c by k can be written as like this. Just a minute, I just have to. plus c by k uh, x dot c by k x dot plus x what is e of t some function so now this can be uh, further written as uh, i would take omega n squared out omega n squared out if i take this is going to be 1 by omega n squared x double dot plus c by k uh, into omega n squared x dot plus omega n squared x and that's equal to e of t right i have divided this all by k so this k is there that k can be taken on this side by k um, no. Let's start. I made a mistake here. There is this K factor. This K is taken out here. If this function happens to be e of t happens to be my direct delta function right and uh, uh, if k happens to be this constant here and i would have here uh, this term can be uh, rewritten as uh, this is my differential equation right still it is in the differential equation form i should convert that into uh, an algebraic form by taking laplace uh, transform. Considering initial conditions are zero, then it would become one by omega n square. This is taking Laplace transform with initial conditions of zero. Then I would have this is s squared x of s plus c by k omega squared can be proved to be 2 zeta omega n squared. Omega n, uh, omega n, not omega n squared, 2 zeta omega n. Uh, we can prove that uh, into uh, this uh, uh, x dot would become uh, yes uh, x of s plus omega n squared x of s. In this side, it is going to be e of s. So, e of s here is what is the uh, Laplace transform of uh, delta s. So, in a direct delta function, when I consider, if I give an impulse, so here, whatever that I consider is direct delta function, then it's going to be 1. Then it's going to be 1. 1 by k is there, right? I, I just have to, this is what I'm, right, how this k has come here. I, 
so that uh, now uh, I can uh, represent uh, this one by omega n squared into uh, uh, s squared plus two zeta omega n into s plus omega n squared into x of s. So x of s by so uh, this uh, since you give direct delta function, what is that I get? An output is my transfer function itself, all right? Mm, so x of s by uh, one. So that's x of s by uh, Laplace transform of uh, direct delta function. That's one. So this is going to be g of s. That's going to be uh, omega n squared by s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So what has happened to this one by k? That's what I'm worried. So this is correct. This one by k has come. What, what is the mistake that I do? Can anyone point out? Can anyone find out? <clears throat> um, After replacing by omega n, uh, k will not come. K will not come? Ah, yes, sir. How? Oh. Sir, uh, omega n is equal to square root of k by m. Yeah, omega n is equal to square root of k by m. So the that's here you have taken. That's what I have written here. See, in this equation, I take k out. So this is omega n squared by so x double dot by omega n squared. This k, where does it go? <coughs> Mm, the k happens to be here. Uh, constant see, and that is what I just made some mistake here uh, to find out that what has happened to k. Our k value is uh, one. <coughs> you understand what is that? Uh, uh, my doubt here is I uh, just to have modified my governing equation uh, in terms of omega n squared to write. I know that omega n squared is equal to k by m. It's natural frequency. Uh, in case of damping value is zero, we have this natural uh, frequency there. So this is a relationship between uh, uh, K and M. Uh, when I take this K out here, and here I have direct delta function, where K happens to be, uh, uh, that has to be come out here, right? So then, um, uh, uh, this one by k, where does it go? Or if we come back by other way, this is the transfer function that we had. G of s is equal to one by uh, uh, this, right? So in this, if I take m out, in this transfer function, if I take m out, it is one by m in numerator divided by s squared plus c by m plus k by m. So k by m is omega n squared. C by m can be proved to be equal to two zeta omega n. Uh, and here it's one by m. So how see uh, this function or uh, this function is uh, same, <coughs> right? So I just uh, no now not able to think on that. Uh, so instead uh, let us uh, find out that. But uh, now take uh, granted that uh, we have our standard uh, input function, uh, standard uh, transfer function of a second order system, g of s is equal to omega n squared by uh, uh, s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So take this is our uh, standard uh, uh, closed loop transfer function. <coughs> Right. <coughs> uh, 
This is our standard closed loop transfer function. So in this, you know all these terms. What are those referred to, right? So what is the zeta? You know, it is damped damping coefficient or damping ratio. Ratio or damped coefficient, right? And the omega n is undamped natural frequency. Damped natural frequency, and uh, you also define what is called damped natural frequency, where this damping ratio is going to be useful. So, damped natural frequency is defined as omega n, the root of one minus zeta square. This is called damped natural frequency. See, in your fundamental uh, of mechanical vibration, you have studied this all. Then. And the poles of this transfer function, poles of this transfer function are uh, roots of the characteristic polynomial. So poles of the transfer function is roots of the characteristic polynomial, characteristic equation. Roots of characteristic equation. Characteristic equation. So, what is that uh, characteristic equation? S square plus 2 zeta omega n. S plus omega n square. That's equal to 0. This is characteristic equation. So, the roots of this <coughs> would be obtained by minus b plus r minus and the roots of b squared minus 4ac by 2a. If you substitute, you will have two roots and the two roots can be. Uh, written as like this. So S1 comma S2 can be. If I substitute minus B is minus 2 zeta omega n plus or minus and the root of 4 zeta squared omega n squared minus 4 into 1 into omega n squared divided by 2 into 1. <coughs> so this is going to be the roots are going to be uh, minus zeta omega n plus or minus. This 2, if I take it inside this radical, it's going to be 4. So 4, 4 goes off. And I have zeta squared omega n squared minus omega n squared. So in that, if I take omega n squared out, it is going to be omega n. And within bracket, I would have zeta squared minus 1. So I can rewrite this as minus zeta omega n plus or minus j omega n and 1 minus zeta square. So what is omega n to 1 minus zeta square? It is omega d. So I can rewrite this as zeta omega n plus or minus j into omega d <coughs> is what is my two roots s1 and s2. See that you have <coughs> Real part here is negative, and you have here uh, complex roots. So you have one uh, uh, minus zeta omega n plus j omega d minus zeta omega n minus j omega d. So you would have both the roots lying on left half plane. So the system is stable system, right? System is stable system. So the poles of uh, uh, characteristic equation. Uh, the poles of transfer function means it is the roots of the characteristic equation. If they lie on the left half plane of your <coughs> complex plane, then uh, the system is stable. So when system is stable here, how do you say that? Uh, is uh, because you have complex uh, roots with the negative real part. So that will ensure that would stay on this side uh, of uh, minus zeta omega n. Uh, corresponding to here, I have one root where this value is omega d, j omega d, and this value is minus j omega d. So I'll have one root here, another root here, and that is on left half plane. Right? So that is the system. <coughs> so now here, this parameter zeta is very important because that is going to give you different cases of your vibratory system. So let us just look at those classification. One is if this uh, zeta value is uh, 
greater than zero and less than one, then we call that system as what? Un under damp system. Under damp system uh, of second order. This is second order system. So when this is under damp system, if zeta value is uh, fraction uh, more than zero, less than one, then it is under damp system and the roots are going to be S1 comma S2 is going to be what? Uh, is this minus zeta omega n plus or minus. Uh, since zeta value is between this value, I would have uh, this value is positive less than one. So this value is positive. So J omega n into one minus zeta square. These are my roots. So second case is if this zeta value is equal to one. So what is that we call it as zeta value is equal to one. What is that vibratory system called? Can anyone? You have seen this, you have studied this, right? What do you mean by damping ratio value one to the vibratory system? You need Krishna? A critical damping. Critically damped system. So that's called critically damped system. So that means that the response uh, is not oscillated response, whereas that uh, come to equilibrium quickly, right? So uh, here you would have uh, then the roots are see the zeta is one, then it is going to be zero. So you would have only negative roots, repeated roots. S1 comma S2 going to be minus zeta omega n. So that's uh, zeta is one. So in this case, it is going to be uh, omega n. And these are repeated roots. Repeated roots. And since both are on this uh, uh, LHS, uh, LS, LHP, uh, left off plane, there's also stable system. And uh, uh, third case is, Obviously, you know that if the zeta value is greater than one, that is called an over damped system. Over damped system. So what would happen here if zeta is greater than one, this is not going to be a complex uh, conjugate part. Instead, you'll have your S1 and S2 roots is going to be minus zeta omega n right uh, plus or minus omega here root of zeta squared minus one so you see here again you have um, here this can be negative number or this can be uh, positive roots it depends upon this value here right zeta value is here is this so zeta square if i take a value greater than one and that's going to be greater value and it's square root. So you may have this is uh, positive or negative. If it is positive, then it come on this side or it's negative that root again on this side. So this is again over damped system. It will take a longer time to come back to its uh, system. So you take a negative root for a simple system uh, and it will take a longer time to um, back to its uh, uh, initial condition, right? Then uh, fourth case is this uh, interesting case which is an undamped system for which is zeta. Damping is present in the system is zero. If damping present in the system is zero, then it is called undamped system. So undamped system is what we look at uh, for uh, uh, um, uh, any disturbance and disturbances that is given uh, uh, with an initial condition or uh, the changes in initial condition would make the um, system to oscillate and it will continue to oscillate. So your roots S1 and S2 is going to be what? When zeta is zero, see this first term is zero in this, and here zeta is zero, so I will have plus or minus J omega n, which are complex conjugate roots. So J omega n, any roots that uh, lie on this vertical complex axis, that refer to an oscillatory motion. So continuous os oscillatory motion, it won't be stopped because there is no resistance, there is no damping, there is no energy dissipation. 
so system stores energy and then uh, that energy would remain constant uh, and then it will keep vibrating right uh, uh, that energy uh, remains constant means one form is getting converted into the other form like that so that's what in the first order uh, first uh, uh, free undamped system that you see that at neutral position uh, or at uh, static uh, mean position you have what is that is called uh, um, your kinetic energy is maximum whereas an extreme position you have your potential energy is maximum so uh, any other point you have combination but this energy is what is constant there is no dissipation because the damping pressure in the system zero so this is how we physically interpret your vibratory system and uh, these roots are now uh, quite useful to talk on its dynamic response uh, characteristics so now uh, let us uh, our uh, intention of uh, class is to find out what is the output so what is the output response for unit step input to the system the system here is second order system right uh, so how do you do that now uh, that's very simple that because i have my uh, standard uh, transfer function so my output response x of s would be simply multiplication of my g of s into <coughs> Uh, unit step function input so that is u of s so u of s here is so input is uh, step function is 1 t 0 so uh, uh, e of t is 1 when t is greater than or equal to 0 e of t is 0 when t is less than 0 that's how you define this function so if this is my input and uh, e of t uh, laplace tensor of e of t is e of s that is going to be 1 by s so it's simply product of omega n squared by s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared into 1 by s this is what is my x of s so laplace inverse laplace transform of this is what is my uh, output response what is my x of t right so how do i get that how do i get that i have to do partial uh, factoring of this uh, then it is easy to apply uh, inverse laplace transform to get that so i am not going to do now uh, uh, this partial fraction it is going to be similar to what we were doing it in first order system uh, i leave it to you to do as homework and you can also refer the textbook uh, ogata for this class whatever that i am teaching uh, is the fifth chapter in this ogata textbook which yesterday i have uh, uploaded in um, the ms teams so please refer to that and we will continue now what would be your response for this right so that is uh, important that we will look at it uh, that would be as this so i would have my uh, so you know how to do the partial fraction uh, uh, you can refer that uh, in the previous lecture so let me write my final uh, response so what is that i would get right so this x of t is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 minus uh, maybe i can write one step before for you so that you can cross check what was that uh, uh, i have it as the same uh, output response in laplace variable is express partial by partial fractions so my y of s uh, so this x of s can be expressed as <coughs> 1 by s minus s yes, plus zeta omega n by s plus zeta omega n s plus zeta omega n square plus omega d square minus 
I have it here. Minus zeta omega n. Zeta omega n by s plus zeta omega n square plus omega d square. This is omega d. So I will have like this. I will have like this. So here if I apply inverse inverse Laplace transform I would get this 1 by s is going to be 1 and uh, here if I have to apply I would get that as minus e raised to minus zeta omega n t into cos omega d t minus here I would have uh, zeta by 1 minus zeta square in radical into e raised to minus zeta omega n t sin omega t t omega d t sin omega d t so this is what is my uh, response that i would get so here if you see what is the laplace transform formula inverse laplace transform formula used that you should know so i would just to give you that so that uh, you can uh, apply that so laplace inverse right laplace inverse of this form i'm taking uh, laplace transform so laplace transform of this function e raised to a t cos b t would be equal to s plus a by s plus a squared plus b square. So this is the formula. So you see here I have s plus a in place of a I have zeta omega n, zeta omega n. In place of b I have omega d, right? If that is so, I would have my uh, uh, inverse Laplace transform of this would be e raised to minus a t. So e raised to minus zeta omega n t and uh, cos b t. So cos b uh, omega d t. So this is one formula and we have an another formula Laplace transform of uh, this function e raised to uh, <coughs> minus a t sin omega or uh, sin b t right it's a formula sin b t would be equal to I have here b by b by s plus a square plus b square so again you look at this term here uh, what is b here now is omega d so omega d to get here uh, what is that i should write omega d to get this omega n can be replaced by uh, omega d uh, this would be what omega d by 1 minus zeta square so i can replace this like this under root under root of 1 minus zeta square right because omega n into this is what is omega d so if i replace this like this minus zeta by under root of 1 minus zeta squared is constant that is there here so omega d is there here zeta uh, uh, omega d is there so i would have uh, this term uh, comes so these are the two formulas uh, you should know from Laplace transform. Uh, so that inverse Laplace transform of this uh, uh, response for unit step function, when you have, you would get its uh, output response in time domain. So now uh, taking that uh, inverse Laplace transform is what you have got here is x of t. x of t. So this is your output function. This is the output function. So now as usual, can we find out is, are there any error in this function? Because what is that we expect when you are giving an excitation uh, uh, 
by step input. I get my output response also a step input. But here you see you do not have that. So you have one minus this. So can I write this uh, in a, again uh, in another convenient form? Like one minus the common term I will take out. So what is common term here is e raised to zeta omega nt. So if I take that out, e raised to minus zeta omega nt, I would have here inside <coughs> cos omega d t minus minus is taken out. So this is going to be plus zeta by under root of one minus zeta square sin omega d t. So this is my output. Right? Output of what? Output of the system where damping is present in the system. According to the damping, we have uh, further uh, classification of under damped, uh, critically damped or over damped system. So this is my uh, uh, dynamic output response for the given uh, unit step input function. <clears throat> So now what is the error? See, you, um, if my uh, steady state means that should reach to this one value because unit step is input, I should get my output also one, but I have this much error. So my error in my response is error signal E of t is what is going to be, <coughs> what is my input E of t minus output x of t. So it is one minus this all. So one plus e raised to minus zeta omega nt into cos omega dt plus zeta by 1 under root of 1 minus zeta square sine omega dt. So this 1, 1 goes. So what is the error function? Error function is going to be e raised to minus zeta omega nt into cos omega dt plus zeta by 1 minus zeta square sine omega dt. Right? So for any value of t greater than or equal to 0, I have this error. This error signal exhibits what? Damped sinusoidal oscillation. At steady state, at steady state, when I will get steady state? At steady state means it is t tends to infinity. Right? At steady state, state that is t tends to infinity. What does that you get? If I put t tends to infinity here, uh, it is going to be zero. So the error e of t is going to be zero. All right? E of t is going to be zero. No error exists between input and output. So if your excitation is uh, uh, unit step function, there is a certain disturbance in your system. So your system would get an output as that same of that input. So this is what you get uh, uh, as this. So steady state response of this would have zero uh, error as t tends to infinity. So it's quite interesting uh, if you are looking at uh, um, um, the time from initial state to final state and uh, time from initial state to infinite state. So you are going, uh, what I mean by that, you can look at now transient response as well as its steady state response. <laughs> right? So now if uh, this is that uh, condition at t tends to infinity, if this is error uh, zero, then uh, I have My response, uh, what is my response going to be? Uh, X of t going to be? X of t is going to be? Uh, with respect to this, if I say, uh, t tends to infinity in my response function if I put here, if I substitute uh, x of infinity, what is that I have? 1 minus e raised to infinity, that's going to be 0. So this is all going to be 0. So that's going to be 1 itself. 
right? You can say like that. You can uh, now can look at if the system is uh, if the system is if your system is critically damped system, uh, what is the uh, transfer function? And then again, you can get your response and you can see whether uh, there is any uh, error present in that. If the system is uh, over damped system, uh, then what is the response? And you can do that all. So I'm not going to do that for other cases. I consider only for the damped, uh, uh, under damped system, we have got these responses. So now uh, let me put in a graphical uh, way my results. My responses. So if I have uh, uh, horizontal axis, T axis, and what is my input function? This is my U of T, which is equal to one. So this function value is one. Uh, so I have here U of T represented as well as X of T, both X of T. So my X of T. Uh, if this system is going to be an under damped system, uh, the response uh, reaching to one here is t tends to infinity. So what is the response that I'll get here is, it will start from here and it will uh, go and go beyond this and then it will have some oscillation and then it will die out. So this is what is going to be there if zeta value is less than one, greater than zero. This would be my response. This would be my response. If my zeta value is equal to one, the critically damped system, my response is going to be something like this. So that would uh, attain my steady state quickly, but uh, it will be gradually reaching. So this is for zeta value is equal to one. If zeta value is greater than one, over damped system, it takes more time to reach this. So this is zeta value is greater than one. If my zeta value is zero, then what is that I get? I get my uh, response to be harmonic response, right? The harmonic response. So that would be, if this is one, it will go till two. So I would have my response that goes uh, to this value. And then it comes down. And then it goes. And then it comes down like this. So this is the response that I would get. So what is this response? Uh, Karma, you see, uh, uh, when t is equal to zero, I have to have this harmonic function. Zero means it is sine omega t, omega nt. So this would have with this natural frequency, omega n. T. So sine omega n t is what is its response, right? So that you can check. How can you check that? Uh, you can just to go back to this. Uh, here is what we have. Uh, here is what we have. Your response. So in this response, if I put zeta equal zero, uh, what would happen? Zeta equal zero. My response is going to be. This is going to be one, and uh, zeta is zero. This is going to be one minus cos omega n t minus zeta is zero. So this term is zero. So it is one minus cos omega n t. One minus cos omega n t, right? So my x of t is going to be one minus cos omega n t if zeta is zero in the system. Zeta is zero in the system. E raised to zero is one. So one minus cos omega dt will not write. Omega dt is what is going to be omega n into one minus zeta n. So omega d is omega n into one minus zeta n. So it's going to be omega n. And uh, uh, here uh, zeta is zero. So zero by any number zero. So this entire thing goes up. So this is my response. This is my response. Uh, so what is happening is uh, here, uh, one minus uh, cos omega nt is what I got it. So my response you see here, uh, what is cos uh, at t is equal to zero, I would have 
cos of zero is one, so one minus one is zero. So that's going to be uh, reflected on this here. So that is why here it starts from zero. It is not sine, it is uh, one minus, so this curve is one minus cos omega n t. Right? So one minus cos omega n t. So if I put t zero, I would get uh, uh, this. So if I put t value, uh, um, uh, when it will be equal to one, uh, when this value is zero. So when this value will be zero, that is going to be uh, omega n t should be pi by two. So when this is pi by two, omega n t equals pi by two, I would have this term as uh, one. Uh, this term is zero, right? So I would have t is pi by two omega n. Pi by two omega n. So I would have at that time this value one. So corresponding t value here is pi by two omega n. So you have correspondingly here. Uh, so this is one and this is two. So when will you have two? When will you have two? I should have here minus one. So that is. Uh, uh, omega n t should be equal to pi. So t value would be pi by omega n. So this value would be corresponding to pi by omega n. Like that uh, you would have your curve. So this is for your undamped system uh, response. And undamped system, when you give a unit step uh, input, the response would go like that. And this one is for an under damped system, and this is for a critically damped system. This is for over damped system or response curves. Uh, now, in this, we have to understand some of the important definitions that I would uh, explain in five minutes and stop the lecture. If you have other class, you can proceed, and later on you can uh, listen back to this lecture. So, what are those uh, some important definitions as far as this is concerned? <clears throat> Uh, transient response of second order system is concerned, right? For this unit step function that we have. So let us look at uh, only an under damped system response. So this is my E of t as well as x of t. If I take my x of t would be something like this, right? something like this it goes so now uh, you define uh, an important terms called one what is that is called delay time what is delay time here uh, I refer to t subscript d delay time as refer to time required for the output to reach half its final value of that in first time so if this is unit step function half the value is 0.5 so the time required to reach half its final value. Final value is one. So half of that final value is 0.5. So this time correspondingly, what is called a TD, called a delay time. Next to definition uh, term called a rise time. Rise time. So what is rise time referred to? T subscript R. So what is rise time referred to? Rise time referred to a time required for the output to rise from zero value to 100% for the first time. So you see this uh, response shoots up above this uh, output, uh, above this one unit uh, input function, and then it comes to settle. So first time when it goes from zero to 100% or five to 95% or 10% to 90% uh, to its final value, I would call that time corresponding time as uh, rise time TR. Then something called the peak time. Peak time. So what is peak time TP? You see that the time required for output to reach for the first time peak of its overshoot. So what is peak of its overshoot is this. So overshoot is this much. So the peak is here. So the time required to go for P 
peak. See, there is a, there can be an another peak here, and so on. So first time peak, first peak of our shoot, the time required is what is called uh, peak time. <clears throat> what is maximum percent over shoot? Next definition is maximum percentage percent over shoot percent over shoot. <clears throat> So that is described by M subscript P. That would be X of T of P minus X of infinity by X of infinity. So what is X of T P? What is the response when peak time corresponding to peak time? So this response here, whatever is there, minus uh, the response at t tends to infinity, that is its unit function, so divided by this. So this is what is called the maximum percent to our shoot. So this will be multiplied by 100 to get in percent. Then uh, very important, uh, another definition called the settling time. Settling time. So what is settling time? It's uh, referred by t subscript s. So settling time is the time required for the output to settle down to its input within plus or minus 2%. So it takes more time. So I can have here this range, which should be plus or minus 2% of my final value of its final value, right? Within uh, some system, it will be taken plus or minus 5%. Some system, it will be considered to be plus or minus 2%. You decide that. What is that final value that you require? So if the system is uh, <clears throat> uh, more damped, what would happen? This oscillation will go and it will have more time to settle down. Uh, less damping means. If the system is more damped, then it would be quickly settled down. Right? So uh, that's what you would understand from damping uh, nature in this. So this is settling time. So here the settling time may be corresponding to this, whatever the time that I have is settling time. <clears throat> right. So these are some important definitions that you see. And uh, we'll stop at this point of time uh, or lecture. And if we have any uh, doubts in this, we can ask. Otherwise, we will end this lecture. And I require two more lectures to uh, uh, come out of this uh, lateral dynamic study and then we will go into our suspension influence and uh, again what do you mean by transient understeer gradient and so on uh, more of our um, vehicle dynamics aspects and one more lecture i require that we will <coughs> um, how do you apply bicycle model or second order system to solve for its uh, tra transient response study right in case it's asked in examination that how do you go about doing it so that I will teach you uh, after the CAT, uh, and then we will have our lectures. So any doubt that you have? Any doubts? Somesh, Satish? <clears throat> no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. no doubt. No, no doubts. Okay. Avkashyan is present. Uh, Ragish is present. So, any response from Akash and Ragish? Yes, no doubt, sir. No, no doubt. doubt. Okay. See, this part, whatever that I am teaching, is maybe more of mathematical and you know to have some control system flavor. But um, uh, if, if you are connecting this study, entire thing to your bicycle model. See, bicycle model again is nothing but a, a second order system. And that second order system is what is readily from bicycle kinematics is represented by two single order system. And uh, we have got readily the state space uh, representation. So by having state matrix, you know how to find the transfer function of the system. And having transfer function, uh, you will be able to get uh, characteristic routes to talk on stability. Or having transfer function, you would be able to get uh, output response. So if you give any uh, step input function that we have seen just now in the second order system. So uh, uh, it is very straightforward now. So your transfer function of your bicycle model is different. 
your transfer function of uh, the uh, spring mass spring system is different right so um, here the parameter governing your uh, um, physical system is only uh, mass damping coefficient and uh, uh, stiffness of the spring whereas in bicycle model you know what are the various parameters that governs the characteristic equation of your bicycle model right uh, you have not only mass you also have to have mass moment of inertia you have to look at its uh, geometry of your vehicle wheel base uh, and uh, where is your cg location so that you know what is b and uh, a and you also should know what is the uh, tire uh, lateral stiffness is and so on so you require all these parameters that is going into your transfer function of your bicycle model but uh, procedure wise it is one and the same to find out now uh, response of your bicycle model what are the responses that you are interested in your bicycle model one is lateral velocity response another one is uh, yaw velocity response so how are these two responses going to be for unit step function or uh, uh, unit impulse function or for uh, ramp function you are finding out you have done with your course so that is what uh, uh, to understand uh, i just have explained you with this simple spring mass uh, damping system <coughs> And uh, I would uh, expect that you would understand this and apply that in your digital assignment in lateral handling, uh, lateral dynamic study. So with that note, uh, let me stop today's class. Uh, and uh, if you have any doubts, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll stop. There are some uh, doubts from uh, one of the students on breaking. Uh, is he present? Nambiar. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, he had to have some doubts in breaking of uh, yes, okay. so you can ask that I would explain now. Okay, uh, sir. Hello. Yeah, I'm able to hear you. Siddharth, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, sir, in breaking efficiency, sir. Yeah. Uh, the formula what we have is A by G by mu P. Correct. And A by G is the uh, G force for breaking. Uh, a by G is deceleration associated with your vehicle during braking. Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah. So, uh, sir, in most of the cars, uh, yeah. we can have uh, like that value to be greater than 1G. Uh, 1G. How? Uh, because, sir. Uh, See, this A by G is not lateral acceleration. No, sir. Longitudinal acceleration itself. Yeah, correct. So, uh, if we have a car which is decelerating from uh, 100 kilometers per hour to 0 kilometers per hour within uh, 120 meters or so, which is quite okay. Uh, okay. Long. So, your, your question is if it happens to be greater than 1, right? A by yes, G. sir. So, how do you define your uh, breaking efficiency, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. See, this braking efficiency is primarily depends upon your distribution of uh, the braking torque in front axle and rear axle, one thing. Mm. So that uh, it has to have an ideal braking condition and uh, there is no uh, locking of your wheels and the locking of all wheels to happen simultaneously. That is one thing that we have understood. And we have defined this braking efficiency as what is the deceleration that you are uh, able to get uh, through this ideal braking uh, um, condition uh, over a given road surface. So that is why we had A by G by uh, this. So if your acceleration value, um, A by G normalized, this is G value is 9.81 meter per second square. So you are saying something, uh, A value can be 1.2 meter per second square and so on. So it is not uh, you get your A by G is greater than one something. So, uh, see that then uh, uh, practically uh, if your vehicle to go from 0 to 100, 100 uh, kilometers uh, in 10 seconds, uh, find out what is the G value, uh, acceleration value. Acceleration see. can be more, acceleration can be more, but when you are applying braking, your deceleration rate cannot be same as that of uh, that, right? Sir, uh, your deceleration from 100, uh, 100 uh, kilometers per hour to stopping distance, right? Okay. Uh, 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 so that distance you have to see. The distance to cover, how much time does it take? 
so in yes, reality uh, the value of that uh, i think it comes below uh, the road surface coefficients dictated by road surface coefficient maximum value of your deceleration in case that happens to go beyond that what would happen is uh, your vehicle would uh, lock and then it would skid the braking system cannot have uh, an ideal braking uh, performance that's what you have looked at from that uh, graph of uh, deceleration associated with your vehicle unloaded and unloaded condition for uh, the uh, distribution of uh, proportion of braking uh, uh, force in the front axle so that graph you have seen so we have got a boundary for rear wheel lock and front wheel lock and yeah. for a given road surface you see uh, these two curves will intersect at a value which is uh, uh, limited by your road surface coefficient so when that point of intersection of boundary of rear wheel lock and front wheel lock uh, uh, is limited by your road surface coefficient uh, then uh, how do you expect your uh, deceleration associated with vehicle can go above that of uh, the road surface coefficient? That cannot happen. That's not possible for the vehicle. That is maximum possible is 100% when is that value of deceleration on a road surface of its mu p. So if your road surface is 0.8, uh, you should have a maximum possible deceleration rate of 0.8 only in order to have an ideal braking scenario of uh, all wheels locked simultaneously. So, so this right. is not considering um, like aerodynamics, right? Yeah, obviously, that is what we were looking at. The analytical expression, what we derived for an acceleration or deceleration associated with your vehicle without considering an aerodynamic or drop or pull other thing. Only you have taken is an initial uh, resistance, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, that is uh, uh, M, uh, W A by G. That only you have taken along with your uh, uh, driving force, net, uh, net, net tractive effort. So that, because uh, that derivation we were doing it, uh, Ethan. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, like, I think why Siddharth's asking is because, uh, like for example, for F1 cars, the deceleration rate can be about above 30 meters per second squared. So that way, the value of um, A in that case would be much greater than the value of G. I think that's why okay, we're having this conclusion. Rate when you're talking, uh, is it on the road surface? That's what I'm saying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's on the road surface only. Uh, 30 meter per second squared means it's divided by 9.81. It's greater than one. So then, uh, how do you yes. define braking efficiency? Yes, so yes. Braking, uh, braking efficiency. So I, I have to look at it because uh, from the theory of Wong, uh, with the limitation assumption exactly that we do not account aerodynamic resistance and so on. Right. So if you do not account them, your um, uh, deceleration is limited by the road surface coefficient. If you have a very slippery road, uh, how do you expect that uh, deceleration? The deceleration rate, what you are saying is uh, the reduction in speed of your engine, maybe. But uh, when that is interacting with your road surface, that is dictated by uh, your uh, road surface. So even you have your uh, uh, sport car uh, would generate a deceleration rate of some 30 meters per second square that you are saying. Uh, if it is on a uh, rough uh, road, it is different. If it is a very slippery road, there is a water surface. So how do you expect that uh, uh, you would have your braking happens there? Then there will be an aerodynamic lift of your vehicle. Then uh, that would go um, unstable, right? So that is why you require a control system to have your brake safe braking that all wheels locking simultaneously. So that is where uh, the limitation of your uh, uh, road surface come. That's not only for braking, uh, even if you look at a powerful engine that you have uh, for the performance of your vehicle, how good it can accelerate, how good it can go up the uh, slope and so on are again limited by uh, one is uh, from uh, engine torque value or uh, mu p times the load on the wheel. So whichever is smaller is what is going to take a hand, upper hand. And the same way uh, is what is here as well in braking also. So your uh, deceleration rate, though it is more possible, but uh, 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 that would be limited by your road surface. So the braking efficiency of your brake system in a vehicle, whether it is passenger car or racing car, I think that would be uh, limited by the road surface coefficient 
to talk on uh, uh, efficiency of braking right that's what is my uh, understanding now but uh, uh, now can you just put forward again your doubt so so by that so like if we go the other way around for this particular doubt then um, that means we can't have a deceleration rate which is greater than 9.81 meters per second squared obviously that's what the, the road surface dictates uh, not only that that is limited by this uh, road surface coefficient value suppose slippery road 0.5 you have then your braking efficiency would be 100% if you are at least able to develop a deceleration rate in your vehicle of 0.5 uh, times g right that's what uh, uh, our theory uh, physics uh, behind uh, uh, tire interaction with the road whether it is for racing car or it is for a passenger car um, the uh, interaction wise if we look at that interaction with the road so in case of racing car you have uh, the grip on a road uh, again is a question mark because you have your uh, tire is smooth tire whereas in uh, passenger cars you have your uh, tires with grooves so there can be a possible drainage uh, easier in this case so that uh, you would have a uh, um, uh, good hold grip on the road whereas uh, 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 race car tires you see um, uh, you have a flat tire right uh, smooth tire so uh, when you have a, a, a greasy surface or water surface and you go at the high speeds and uh, you may have your uh, uh, lift of your tire from the uh, road takes place that's what is we call it as a hydro planning if you are applying braking so in hydro planning speed you see that uh, you have a vehicle to go an unstable state so to avoid hydro planning uh, and you suddenly apply brake and you know that the braking efficiency limited by road surface which is 100 percent so uh, your vehicle is capable of uh, making deceleration rate of uh, uh, greater than 9.81 but that cannot be realized uh, physically uh, in a practical situation of a vehicle right that's how i argue for this question but still uh, you have posed a good question i'll have to look at it let me also find or any uh, anybody else can comment on this question vinith krishna Uh, we also faced this uh, same issue when we were uh, working with the DAs. Working with the DAs, yeah. You, you are working with the DAs. See, I have seen your DA uh, things, but you are varying your mu all. But ultimately, what I was expecting is that uh, uh, the graph, what is that you see from loaded and unloaded condition with the boundaries for rear wheel lock and front wheel lock, that graph is what I wanted. And uh, I have seen two assignments, uh, uh, and both assignments that is not uh, been represented. Uh, maybe you can submit at the point uh, uh, now. That's fine, but you can rework on it again. So you vary, and you have so many graphs, but uh, you have to also interpret, and then you have to write them uh, clearly. Uh, just putting the graphs uh, and leaving it to me to uh, you know uh, infer the graph is not uh, uh, an analysis. So you should connect that all to this. So you should have. Uh, a graph of uh, deceleration associated with the vehicle uh, for uh, application of uh, proportion of braking uh, effort in the front axle, braking torque in the front axle, considering mu of a particular road. And if you vary that mu value, what is happening to the graph? That's what I was intended to uh, uh, look at in your assignment. Right? So obviously, uh, see the deceleration that you are uh, saying no can be uh, possible uh, is from engine point of view or brake system point of view for an ideal condition. If it is not interacting with uh, the road, right? I have my vehicle. Uh, I do not uh, um, uh, keep my tires on road. I just do a testing, uh, having it on a jack, and uh, I go to high speed, right? I suddenly break fully, so it stops. So what is the deceleration that is possible? Is what you are the rate is what you are saying it, right? Suppose you say 30 meters per second. So can you just say that uh, what would be the distance for that deceleration rate, and the vehicle would go? Can you just calculate quickly and tell me, Ethan? Yes, assuming uh, maybe 100 kilometers an hour from. Yeah. 
yeah so how do you get uh, consider 30 uh, meters per second squared constant value deceleration so what is your distance how do you get the distance what is the formula for constant acceleration or deceleration you uh, have so v squared, v squared equals u squared plus 2as yes. so substitute and find the distance yes yes i'm doing that So 100 kilometers per hour, you are saying convert that into meter per second, divide that by 3.6, right? 12.8 uh, meters. 12.8 meters. Yes, sir. Uh, 100 by 3.6 divided by. So uh, that is 60. So how that is 12.5? Your calculation is not correct. Just to see. U square, sir. Yeah, U squared is what is your initial speed? 100 kilometers per hour. So 100 by 3.6 minus 2 into 30 into s equal to zero. So 2 into 30 is 60. So s will be 100 squared by. Okay, that's 100 squared by. Squared by 100 by 3.6 square by 60. So what does that you get? 12.3 12.3 meters something right yes sir uh, 12.3 meters that is that uh, shortest distance that vehicle can stop that you are saying but what would happen if we are uh, road is slippery see this is considering uh, uh, considering uh, the road has got a good uh, grip right Uh, considering the road has got um, the same, uh, so can you have MP valley greater than one? We have road surfaces like that. Uh, what are the uh, uh, test track uh, road surface uh, MP valley? Do you have practical value like you have been saying for this acceleration? Sir, coefficient of friction can never be greater than one because if that ever happens, the body can never move. Uh, how how do you say that? That's what we've been taught in the lower classes. No no no. Coefficient of uh, sliding friction uh, is different. So the Coulomb friction is different, and the road surface characteristic is different. Right? See, whatever in your basic engineering mechanics that you have studied, we call that as mu uh, s. What is that? Is called the maximum static friction value. Right. If uh, um, I, I would just uh, go to this slide and explain you that. So if you look at here, uh, you have two scenarios, right? One is the block on the surface. Yeah, others can go. See, others can go. Uh, if you have a class, others can go. I just to clarify these doubts. So if I apply a force P, if this is of load W. Uh, then uh, I would have my resistance developed. Uh, that is what is friction force, and I would have uh, corresponding normal here. So this reaction, if this is a rough surface, right? The reaction uh, would be this. This is my reaction. So you see that uh, <coughs> when I have my uh, P zero, simply nicely sitting on this. Uh, If I apply force P and uh, gradually increase this force P, I would uh, have still this block is under equilibrium. It means that friction force is balancing this P, but that cannot happen forever for an increase of P. So there is a value uh, where this friction reaches its maximum value that is dictated by the roughness of the surface, which is given by mu s. So this friction value happens to be mu s times this normal n <laughs> is what is law of friction. Uh, then uh, this block will start accelerating to the right, right? That is what you will see. So if I take here, 
my friction force in y axis and application of force on this axis and uh, it will go in 45 degree line till um, the value reaches its maximum value fs value after that uh, the state of this block would be not in a static state so till here it is static and after that it will be a dynamic state and in dynamic state you see this coefficient value is reduced and that is what is the fk kinetic friction value so this is sliding friction <clears throat> the sliding will take place when in your vehicle this sliding will take place when in your vehicle it will take place when uh, um, the vehicle is skidding wheels are locked then this will happen on the other hand if i have my wheel if this is to roll without sliding i should have here a force which is a friction force which should be which should be uh, which should be if this is what is a rigid wheel remember it's not an pneumatic wheel right rigid wheel so my friction force would be in this direction as long as in this direction you have which is less than vs times n then only this can roll that's the condition if this is equal to vs uh, n then it is uh, stop rolling and this point will be sliding and the friction force would be in this way appearing so for a rolling for rolling without skid what is the condition is the friction force what is developed here should be less than vs n and this friction force will oppose that driving moment so if this is rotating like that this friction will always oppose to uh, <clears throat> stop the rotation so this will be in this direction but this value reaches to me as n then what would happen this uh, rolling no more takes place there are other that stops and then the wheel will slide <clears throat> and then the friction force would be in this direction like this so that is what is the actual basic theory of dry friction and i said here it's a rigid wheel is because there is no deformation there is no contact patch here so this would happen in your locomotive wheels so you can see suddenly brakes are applied you would see this noise and the wheels will stop rotating and that will skid and then go in the locomotive right as a non rotating wheel like that it will go and stop if you do not hear any noise and it simply stop that means uh, your your uh, um, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this friction force is not reaching to its mu times n, but it is very close to that, and it is stopped, decelerated, like that it is. So there, it is dictated by this. So you are saying that mu s value cannot be greater than one, right? So that is the maximum static friction value. But what mu p that we are saying is not called uh, maximum static friction value. Rather, it is called coefficient of road sorry road addition coefficient of road addition so this is what is uh, going to govern your um, tractive force or braking force that is going to be developed uh, with a phenomena called the slip or with a phenomena called the skid for braking so your uh, brake uh, this force would go linearly till some value then it is going to non linear zone and it will go to its maximum value dictated by this mu p times w and then it would uh, after that if slip increases that that what do you mean by that is that adhesion zone of your contact patch is getting uh, reduced and then it will go to a trailing end and disappears that ensures a complete uh, uh, fall to mu s times yen w right in this case mu s times w and that is what is 100% slip which is going to be a scenario of 100% spinning <coughs> of your vehicle this is your tractive force if this is happens to be your braking then the same scenario right it will go to its maximum and then it falls when it falls to mu s times w then it will be skidding so you do not want this so you has to be operating in this zone in both the case for that you require abs and uh, traction control system linear system 
So this mu p dictated here <coughs> is not to be less than one, right? That's what again, uh, since you got this question that I say, so you can have a road surface where you can have mu p value greater than one also, I think so. <coughs> right, Siddharth uh, Ragis. So we have to find this now. Uh, what is that uh, mu p value for maximum road surface? Or if you take a standard uh, test track for your uh, race cars, <coughs> what is the road surface coefficient? And as you say, uh, if this is so, how do you define braking efficiency for your racing cars? So you have to uh, go through literature or Google it and then find the uh, solution. And uh, what is that uh, has been explained? Is it concurrent with my explanation or not? Let us just uh, see that. See, I just have spontaneously taken your doubt. You have put forward a very good doubts uh, that really uh, make us to think further. Uh, so uh, I think I was trying to answer your question, but uh, uh, it to be convinced looking at an evident statements, right? Uh, is it uh, uh, all right, uh, Siddharth? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so what is your opinion now on uh, breaking efficiency? Mm, sir, I think it can go greater than one as in the efficiency itself, because what uh, yeah. it's said <laughs> in the Wong book is that it uh, mm. It is only a way of telling us how it is, how it is. Uh, it's only expressing it to us, the entire phenomenon to us. Not yeah, so the case studies are a real time tested vehicle on 0.8 uh, mu p, uh, the light truck uh, as well as your yeah. passenger car. So those data, what were provided, is a real time uh, data. Uh, that uh, what is the vehicle weight, all are given. So it's not only theory. So with that uh, uh, formula fitted, there was uh, your uh, <clears throat> uh, with an assumption, assumed formulas, what was derived, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So breaking efficiency, something efficiency means it's hundred percent is maximum, right? So uh, that's what I'm thinking. How can you have a, a two hundred percent efficiency saying or one fifty percent efficiency saying? Huh? <coughs> so you get 100 marks or you get an additional mark and more than 100 marks it's 100 percent right only so uh, but you have raised a good question you said uh, in your whatsapp message it's a small doubt on breaking efficiency but uh, still uh, that is a good question that you asked let me also find out that uh, some more uh, supporting statements apart from what i have explained so someone uh, was telling about um, uh, this mu s. So mu s and mu p should be having a clarity. Uh, mu s in case of a rigid uh, object interaction with the surface, <coughs> rigid object interaction with surface. And the same uh, we call it as mu p addition coefficient when you have a, a deformable structure uh, interaction with the uh, surface, and such a surface interaction is with the pneumatic tires because under loading you see there is a contact patch. There is an uh, elastic deflection of your tire <coughs> uh, tread as well as uh, uh, your uh, side wall shear deformation and so on. So that is deforming. In such cases, uh, uh, your concept of drive friction uh, from me has to be, uh, you have to come out and you have to look at. There is something, uh, <coughs> there is also a textbook for uh, friction uh, uh, of these wheels, uh, pneumatic tire friction uh, theory, small book that uh, Book name, I'm not able to recollect it is there. <clears throat> so uh, we, we have to go and study a lot in that. Uh, I think there and the VP value is uh, uh, explained to can be uh, greater than one. <clears throat> right? So let me just check that as well. So Ethan was asking, right? Ethan uh, Danish was asking about this mere doubt. Uh, is that clear to you now? Sir, that wasn't my doubt, sir. Oh, my doubt was about the. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. No, sir. Like the only doubt I had was um, if ignoring uh, aerodynamic forces, we can have a value of deceleration greater than uh, the value of G. Oh, but I think that's not possible. See, in our uh, uh, problem formula, uh, there are sample problems in our Wong textbook, and those are real vehicles. So you see that we have a greater than a G value. No, the sir. This is not. 
Yeah, right? so that's what I'm saying. So I I think um, we can get only a greater value of deceleration if we. Uh, so then uh, my doubt is uh, how could you say that a racing car can have deceleration rate greater than nine point eight one that you are saying. So where is that you have read through that? Uh, can you have a supporting document statements that you have your racing car's uh, value of uh, deceleration greater than G? Now my question is that if we have, please send me those uh, papers or uh, the documents. So that is, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Siddharth. Uh, sir, we have a race today, uh, like F1 race is going on this okay. weekend and uh, they will be showing us the data on the TV itself. So okay. when they're going to break or during the entire braking process, they're going to show how many G forces the car is taking up at one particular corner and that goes up to 5.66 G's depending on the track and depending on the corner. And uh, not only that, sir, when we no, did no. the depending on the yesterday, I would say, see, there are two uh, things. Uh, one is uh, your acceleration when you take that acceleration can have um, components Right. Yes, so we're talking about the longitudinal one. You so can tell so. magnitude of acceleration when you say you know it is a total acceleration of your vehicle, but the acceleration has to be resolved in uh, three components. One is along longitudinal direction, lateral direction, as well as in normal direction. <coughs> right. Yes, sir. Uh, um, the component along longitudinal di uh, directions. What is that we are talking on? Yeah, they they break it down into two mm. parts. Mm. Only uh, one is braking G's. And the mm -hmm. other one is cornering G-forces. Breaking okay. G-forces go up to uh, four or five, maybe three, three to uh, range. Range is three to five. Breaking force, right? The breaking force you are talking. And uh, what is the unit that you say? Four point something you say. What is the unit? G converted into G, sir. Divided by G. Divided by G. That does happen to be four point something. Yeah. Breaking. Okay. And uh, what is that uh, on your uh, steep cornering? Uh, it is. What is the value? Cornering at, uh, at the British GP, it goes up to six Gs from uh, during chickens and slalom cutting. <laughs> okay. See, the lateral acceleration component is what is uh, that we have seen. It can be you no know, more than uh, you no know, one one point five. So there also you have uh, for your vehicle uh, parameters. If you know, uh, you can have uh, especially this uh, um, racing cars. This bicycle model can be more suitable model because you have um, very rarely uh, um, uh, the rollover. See, we could see in the formula races sometimes, no, the rollover unstable state, you know, the vehicle suddenly roll over. Otherwise, uh, most of the time you see uh, uh, the vehicle is on uh, road and high speeds, and then uh, no, if it is uh, uh, controlled motion. You see that always a uh, yaw motion <clears throat> only takes place to maybe while uh, doing cornering. So that is uh, 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 that is uh, most suitable bicycle model you can have. So if you have your racing car vehicle mass and uh, your other parameters, uh, you would be able to see what would be the critical speed uh, uh, of lateral acceleration uh, to maintain yaw stability. And what would be the critical lateral acceleration to maintain your uh, rollover stability? We can have such studies again. Rollover stability to study, I have to incorporate suspension into my thing that we are going to see in our studies after um, our CAT. But uh, your stability, uh, where your vehicle suddenly uh, you know, spinning and then it is going on the road that we could see in uh, Formula Race cars. So suddenly what would happen? Um, the one vehicle would be spinning on the road and then it is uh, arbitrarily getting out of the track. <clears throat> but it is not rolling over. So that's what is an unstable state in yaw motion. And that would happen <clears throat> when, uh, what would be the lateral acceleration is what we have uh, already uh, looked at in our um, study. Uh, what is that study? Uh, we had our steady state gain, lateral acceleration response study. So you could see that uh, when that is all uh, at critical speed, it happens like that. You can uh, predict, right? <clears throat> so as you say now, that is that uh, you say I can witness that in the uh, television. Another thing, do you have a, a document? You have it Googled and then you have seen. Um, put forward your uh, doubts in Google. We have uh, that some evidence straight away that is shown in that. So we have to see that what unit they talk and uh, all. 
as you say it is uh, in g's 4.5 g's or something then uh, let me also look at it what it is right race call dynamics itself no uh, to be separately looked at when you look at light track and uh, its speeds and uh, uh, passenger car and its speeds and racing car its speeds is all together different so you have a race car dynamics itself is <clears throat> they are separately dealt uh, with the uh, standard textbooks uh, when do you have any uh, race car dynamics textbook study you have uh, gone uh, through yes sir yes sir i i yes. i'll have to look for it i used to have it in my undergraduate uh, yeah there is a popular textbook for race car dynamics you know that willigan willigan sir yeah so you can go through in that book and then you would uh, you, know, you can see that right one one thing is that and um, this uh, dynamics what we were doing in wong textbook is uh, um, especially on braking performance what we had in our classes confined to um, you know, passenger cars and light trucks in passenger cars you would get uh, more uh, uh, braking efficiency uh, the maximum deceleration achievable uh, between unloaded and loaded compromises or something around 0.7 something you got whereas in this on the light track you got around 0.64 for the given uh, parameter of the vehicles for examples in the wong textbook uh, because we don't drive our passenger car or light track like a racing car on the roads right so this dynamics part what we have done is correct as far as these vehicles are concerned but uh, race car dynamics uh, textbook that we have to look at and you have rightly posted the question of braking efficiency they are to define right so your braking efficiency uh, uh, doubts would come because uh, you had listened to the uh, longitudinal deceleration can be of 4 g's or 5 uh, something that you are saying right so let me check that sir i got the doubt while yeah. uh, calculating for the ds uh, like for da2 sir okay so what was that doubt what did you get so uh, the car whatever i taken had the stopping distance to be 36 meters okay. or 0 uh, 100 to 0 okay and that gave me a deceleration value of uh, 10 meter per second square 10 meter per second square so it's almost one right uh, yeah. 9.81 uh, if you take that's one so uh, then you are road mu p condition what is that you consider there 7.0.72 uh, 0.72 is road MEP and your calculation had come out to be that much. How that's possible is this formulas of Wong textbook, what we derived? It's going higher, sir. That, that, that is where I got the doubt, sir. As in why, how can uh, efficiency go more than uh, okay. 100? Uh, you have uh, checked cross check. Can you send your uh, uh, that page alone? What is the calculation that you have done? What formula you have used? In WhatsApp, you can send me. Let me just go through that, right? Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, this is a good discussion. I think uh, like this, you uh, know, more doubts are there. You know, it would uh, be nice to discuss as well, right? You can post. Uh, maybe I would not uh, disturb a regular class, but I would uh, encourage you to ask doubts, and then you know, I would uh, apply my mind, and we can find for the solution, obviously, right? Yeah, with that note, uh, yeah, we'll stop today's lecture. Is that fine? So uh, we'll conclude our class. Uh, for you, the uh, assignment is please uh, look into some literature or Millikan Millikan race car dynamics textbook uh, to understand uh, more on this braking efficiency of race dynamics car. And again, uh, look at the Wong textbook. Uh, let's find uh, and uh, let's find uh, more clarity on this aspect, right? So with that, uh, let me uh, stop today's class. Is that fine? Sir, CAT 2 pattern will be similar to CAT 1, sir. Okay, CAT 2, I, as I was telling you, you were uh, portion till whatever I have done till Monday's class, right? Uh, uh, after that, whatever that we have been uh, learning now would be for your uh, uh, final assessment test or for the knowledge point of view, we can see. Uh, you would have three questions as it is uh, a similar way cat one you had so there can be a, a two two option for each question so some of you get uh, one way some other students will get one b so you would have a question from breaking you would have a question from 
uh, uh, your uh, um, bicycle model study and you can also have a question from steady state cornering or this handling test what all that i have taught that's what i was telling uh, you can go prepare as per my lecture a video a lecture and the notes uploaded uh, after the lecture so that is quite sufficient so if you understand that like you are asking now like critical doubts so listen back to the videos that's fine for preparation for your exam because i already posted that uh, smart board uh, whatever that i have uh, written during my class lecture so if you have that is written on your notebook your preparation is that uh, uh, not to compile them and then write it down in the exam so maybe for exam point of view you are doing it something but to understanding point of view no please listen back once again this video and post your comments uh, uh, in the video lecture i would appreciate and i would give some special attention for those who are posting comments on those videos right and uh, that would be sufficient so three questions that you have to answer uh, and it won't be more lengthy and uh, you should uh, uh, answer to the point that's important and you should always support your discussion uh, with the less text and uh, more of uh, graphs or uh, diagrams um, free body diagrams and describe uh, precisely right so when i read that i should uh, you know feel that yes your understanding is what you are uh, scripting in your paper rather than uh, you are writing down all equations or whatever is there in textbook or something that you fill the page two pages and you send uh, no that may not uh, convey uh, uh, to the point uh, answering in the exam so that is the idea of uh, open book test so it is all your understanding should exhibit in your uh, paper right is it fine we need uh, yes sir yeah good uh, obviously this uh, uh, learning from the classroom would help you on for exam as well as doing this da so this doing your da is your own uh, you know uh, strength uh, whatever that you learn and you are having the data of your vehicle and uh, some data is not there you look at in my class lectures then uh, what would be a right assumption of the data Uh, if you make an appropriate assumption you are going to do like you got a good doubts today because you get some values which are uh, 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 coming uh, some doubts it is arising some doubt like today's class we have seen that still i have to look at back uh, deriving this transfer function for second order system that 1 by k factor what's happened to that <laughs> i have to see uh, so like this no when we do we will have some doubts right uh, okay good day uh, and if you do not have any doubts i will stop recording and um, uh, we'll end uh, we'll disperse for the day that's fine yes sir